We're in the first Sunday of the month. We're going to look at another one of the Psalms. Psalm 22. Why hast thou forsaken me? Now, the Lord has not forsaken us. Sometimes it seems like he has, doesn't it? We feel like we have been forsaken. I'm reminded of that uh, poem that you've seen about footprints in the sand. You, you know how it goes. You come to the end of life journey and you look back over the, the footprints you've left in the sand. And, and there's two sets of footprints where God has walked with you through your life. But you look and in those real troubled times of life, there's just one set of footprints. Say, God, why in the most troubled times of my life did you leave me? And then God says, no, that, that's when I carried you. So God doesn't forsake us. But it seems like it. Th this particular psalm, why hast thou forsaken me? God carries us to the foot of the cross. In Matthew chapter 25, 45 through 50. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood near when they heard this said, This man called up for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a spurge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let be. Let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Those words, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. The commentators tell me that's Aramaic. It's very similar to the, the Hebrew language. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew. It carries us back to the first verse of the 22nd Psalm that begins with those words. My God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? I'm going to show you this psalm is a psalm about the sufferings of Christ on that cross. Now it's very poetic in how it describes this. But that's where this takes us. What does it mean? But what does that mean that God forsook him on the cross? Did God forsake him? And here are the words that when we think about the cross, th these are the words that cause us to tremble. Now, I've read some real grotesque descriptions about how Christ suffered on the cross and, and medically and physically, what all was taking place as he was there. And, and I don't like hearing about that. I suppose there's value to that to help impress upon us the extent of his suffering but the way the Bible describes that suffering is sufficient. And he's going to describe some of that here in this psalm. Now to the chief musician. And then we've got some strange words in the inscription. If you've got your King James Bible and you look, there's an inscription at the top. I don't know if they're in all the Bibles. Some may have tried to translate this. But those strange words are, Igelith Shahar. What does that mean? And the common or the uh, translators were modest enough to leave that untranslated. They weren't sure themselves. Well, I understand that uh, the words may mean the hind of the morning. What's that? Well, a hind is an old name for a deer. It's an old English word for, for a deer. Think about the deer in the morning. You hunters know about that. That's why you get up in the middle of the night and go up and climb up in the tree stand so you can be ready when the, when the day breaks and the deer that comes out in the morning. And then what are you going to do? You're going to shoot him. <laughs> well, you know, 
are you shooting Bambi? That's what some of the kids might think. Poor little innocent deer out there in the morning and, and then look what's going to happen. And so some have thought maybe that's what this is, the hunted deer. Well, it could be something else. But it's just interesting to me, those strange words we find in the descriptions of some of these psalms. But it is a psalm of David. And so it begins, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me in the words of my roaring? Now these aren't words from the cross. That first line is, but that roaring. I want you to think of someone that is in agony of pain. Think of a wounded animal and how it would just roar. And that's the significance of word here. Here I am roaring. Why art thou so far from helping me? O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, and thou hearest not. And in the night season, I am not silent. You ever feel like God doesn't hear? But well, that's the way this psalmist is feeling. And, and think about how Christ must have felt. God's not paying attention to me. But then in verse 3, he says, But thou art holy. Thou inhabitest the praises of Israel. I'm reminded of that psalm that says, When I consider the heavens and the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars that thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? They put a, what is man that you're mindful of him anyway? Why should God listen to you? That seems to be what the psalmist is referring to here. The next verse. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. It is a comfort to go back and read those stories of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and see how God was with him. You remember how God was with Joseph and Joseph was with God and how he came through all those trials. But here the psalmist is thinking, well, you were with it. Why not me? Why don't you help me? He says, but I'm a worm and no man. A reproach of men and despised of the people. I'm a worm. There's a song we sing. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote such sacred head for such a worm as I? I heard somebody say, well, I, I'm not going to sing that. I'm not a worm. And I understand that sentiment. But, but think here, Christ here is referring to himself as a worm. Prophetically, listen, if he can say that, I can say it. And what's he talking about? He's talking about how he is reproached and despised. And the way men are treating him as though he were no better than a worm. Isaiah 53.3, he is despised and rejected of men, and we esteem him not. Verse 7. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake their head saying, He trusted in the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, saying he delighted in him. So we see in Matthew 27, verses 39 through 43. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priest mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross. And we'll believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him. Now, he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. So closely aligned with this psalm, isn't it? Verse 9. How can a father turn his ears away from a cry like this from his child? But thou art he that took me out of the womb. 
Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me. For trouble is near. For there's none to help. I've heard the reason the sky became dark while Christ was on the cross is the father couldn't bear to watch his son in such agony and, and turned away from the darkness. Now that's not a that's not a Bible teaching, but that's the way some people have thought about the darkness. And what must it have been? It causes us to tremble. How did the earth survive? How could any man be left alive after what was done on that day and what the father witnessed them doing to his son? And he compares those around him that are doing this to him to beasts. Many bulls have compassed me around. Strong bulls of basin had beset me round. Think about an angry bull that's just panting and ready to stab and gouge at you. And that's the way he feels. They've gaped on me with their mouth as a ravening and roaring lion. And then his own weakness. But I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. You think they would be hanging there like that? My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a pot shared, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. Thou hast brought me to the dust of death. I'm reminded how Christ said on the cross that uh, I thirst. That the scriptures might be fulfilled. He said, I thirst. Now that was a vessel full of vinegar and they filled a spurge with vinegar and they put a hyssop upon it and put it to his mouth. The dust of death. They gave me, the, the scripture he's talking about there is actually from Psalm 69, 21. They gave me also gall for my mate, and in my thirst gave me vinegar to drink. It, it's said by some, Jesus cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. And some said he calls for Elias. And so they put this moisture on this, this vinegar on this spurge and put it up to moisten his lips and some have thought maybe it's because his lips were so dry and parched he couldn't, he couldn't say things well, he wasn't coming out and they misunderstood him because of the mumbled manner in which he was having to speak through those dry lips the dust of death he said, dogs have compassed me in the assembly of the wicked. They have enclosed me, referring them now as bulls and lions and dogs. And, and then he says, they pierced my hands and my feet. And they did. Remember when Thomas said, I want to see the nail prints. Jesus said, you can come see my hand. Look at the nail prints in my hands. And behold my feet. Because they nailed him to the cross and literally did just what this psalm said in the fact that they pierced his hands and feet. And then I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. And what I think is one of the most cruelest the most cruel verse in the Bible is Matthew 27, 36, where it said, sitting down, they watched him there. Just sit here and watch him go through this. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Well, they did. Matthew 27, 35. They crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots. 
that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them and upon my vesture did cast lots. But be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength. Hasten thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling, from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. Now don't think of the mythical creature of a, of a unicorn, that one horned animal. That's not what we're talking about here. Some wild beast with horns. Maybe think of those bulls of Bashan. So we got the dogs and the lions and the bulls here again at this passage. And they've closed in for the kill. And at this point, everything changes. This psalm of agony is now a psalm of praise. Look at the next verse. I will declare my name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation I will praise thee. It's like a different psalm now. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him all ye seeds of Jacob. Glorify and fear him all ye seed of Israel. When he cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost, he goes into the presence of God, and now there is praise. He says, Thou hast not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither had he hid his face from him, but when he cried unto him, he heard. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Was he forsaken? He said, you don't hear me. But here in verse 24, he heard. Sometimes we feel forsaken. It doesn't mean we're forsaken. If anyone ever appeared to be forsaken, surely it was Christ hanging on that cross. And he utters that so we would know how he feels. But it's not a statement of fact. Because he didn't despise or abhor him. And when he cried unto him, he heard. He didn't turn his face from him. And then he says this. My praise shall be unto thee in the great congregation. I'll pay my vows before them that fear him. The meek shall be satisfied, and they shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee, for the kingdom is the Lord's. And he's the governor of the nations. He talk about, I'll praise thee in the midst of my brethren, the great congregation, the meek, the kingdom. He died for his church. He gave his life for the church. He shed his blood for the church. And now we praise him, as it says in this psalm. And then there's the great commission found in the 22nd psalm. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the kindreds of the nation shall worship before thee. It's because we go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and carry it to every nation. And now all over the world, those of all nations, praise him. 29. All they that be fat upon the earth shall eat and worship. That sounds prosperous, doesn't it? And they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. We're going to live, and we're going to die. But in the midst of all this living and dying, it says, A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness to the people that shall be born that he hath done this. And this carries me in my thoughts right into Acts chapter 2. 
where Peter said, Repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Then what did he say? For the promise is to you and your children and all them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. You see, where he says, The people that shall be born shall declare to his righteousness unto a people that shall be born that he hath done this. That's us. We're the people that shall be born from this psalm. And now God's righteousness in saving man can be boldly declared because Christ suffered on that cross for us and paid that penalty for us so we can praise him. Well, you want to take advantage of that. If you miss that in your life, well, you just missed it. And so come to him. And take advantage of the goodness that he has provided for us through that suffering on that cross. And be baptized into his name and be part of that great congregation. If you'll respond to that, then do so as we sting the invitation song.